for us to just continue to get the gospel in our community. We're praying for a replacement youth pastor. Um, and yeah, guys, thank you so much again for your diligence and prayer. Today's reading is going to be out of Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 14. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an inhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for it leave, its leaves remain green, and it, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by justice. In the midst of his days, they will leave him, and, it, and at his end will be a fool. He will be a fool. The glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake thee shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from thee shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of, of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today, for all you assembled here in the building as well as online. We just ask your spirit upon this whole service, your hand upon this service, God, that you would speak through me and speak into the hearts of all who hear your word today, God. And let our worship that we're about to praise you with, God, be an acceptable offering to you, God, and pleasing to your ears. We love you so much. Thank you for our King and Savior, Jesus and for your Holy Spirit, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Oh.
As you guys know, we've been going through the book of Acts. You guys can hear me up there, right? Yeah. No? No? It's weak. Oh. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. You guys hear it a little better? Yes. Yeah. Okay, right on. All right, so as you guys know, we can go up to the Book of Acts. Uh, we're going to continue there today. Um, we will be there, uh, you know, until we finish it. Uh, but just to give you guys a perspective on that, when we started this church back in uh, September of 2019, we did four messages on the gospel. We then started in John chapter 1, verse 1. We finished John, and then we started Acts. We're only in Acts chapter 13. That was 2019, September. So we take our time and meticulously go through the Word because... You know, we don't just want to, um, you know, get a couple of things out of the Word. We want to, you know, we want to dig deep. You know, I, I like to. I, I know that um, the Lord, I believe with all my heart, He wants us to be doing that. And so that's what we do here at Timberland, just verse by verse. Sometimes, like last week, we did three verses. Today, we're going to actually do about eight or nine verses. So um, we'll get a little bit through, but we won't quite finish chapter 13. But anyway, we will be in chapter 13 today. I just want to remind you from last week. Um, you know, in order for us to have success, you know, God has given us a model for the church and a model for ministry to build the church. And um, we need to make sure that we're following that model. The model of the church is simply this, that all are welcome who will receive Christ, right? There's no, there's no room for anybody to be excluded if indeed they will receive Christ by repenting their sin and placing their faith and trust in Him and His work, His redeeming atoning work on the cross. Uh, and, and if he does that, it doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter, you know, whether you're black or white, male or female, you know, uh, your education level, it, 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 you know, if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. Christ welcomes all, and as we acknowledged last week, it is level at the foot of the cross for all souls. Uh, the other part of that model of the church is the ministry model, and it's plain and simple as this, that the Holy Spirit has to lead all things. He has to be the beginning of it, right? He has to be the inspiration of it. He has to be in the midst of it. And he has to be the one who sends it out. And he has to be the one who's executing it through the church. Um, and if he's not doing that, right? I mean, he's not the one bringing those souls into the church. He's not the one building up those souls. He's not the one sending them out for the mission. If he's not doing that, 
then the church model does not work. And so we got to make sure, guys, um, you know, even in the little things that we do, whether you're, you know, you're sweeping the floor or whatever it is you're doing, when you're doing something in ministry, and I'll just tell you, every part of your life is ministry, make sure you're doing it by the Holy Spirit. That's the only way it's going to work, guys. And um, again, um, the last thing we have to remember about the model of the church is that it's all, you know, been been uh, made possible by the calling of God. God calls us to salvation. God calls us to ministry, etc. So uh, just make sure, guys, that you're keeping that mindset, guys. That's not just a ministry model. That's a life model, okay? Uh, but as I said a minute ago, we're, we're going to be continuing Acts chapter 13, and today we'll be discussing the power of God, and specifically the power of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person in the triune Godhead, and our reliance on the power of God, guys. So I'm going to go ahead. We're going to be in uh, verses 4 through 12 again here in Acts 13. I will read those verses, and then we'll go through them. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went, back, uh, he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Let's pray one more time. Father, we thank you again for your word, God. Just again, speak through me and uh, allow us again, God, to receive something from you today. Again, that you be glorified by our lives evermore, God. Again, thank you for your son and your spirit. In Jesus' name. So remember, guys, this is the church in Antioch, Syria. Barnabas and Saul and Simeon and Lucius and Manan were together. And these are the leaders of the church, right? This church in Antioch, Syria is a Gentile church. There are Jews there, but there's also non-Jews that are part of this church. So it's, it's a very uh, you know, diverse church, if you will, right? Um, and Holy Spirit tells the leaders that I just mentioned that they, they're to send out Barnabas and Saul. And I want you guys to see this. This is, this is Saul. This is his first missionary journey. Remember I told you last week he had three missionary journeys. This is the first of his missionary journeys, guys. And this is very revolutionary for the church because up to now, they, you know, they hadn't tried anything like this. But if you notice, it wasn't like Barnabas went to Saul and said, hey, you know, let's go try to take the gospel somewhere. No, the Holy Spirit is the one who sent them out. And I, I need you guys to see this because, again, prior to verse 4, we read this. Uh, then after fasting, again, uh, chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Then after fasting and praying, they, that is the church, laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the question is, did the church send them off or did the Holy Spirit send them off? I want you guys to know, just based on what I said a minute ago regarding the model of the church and ministry, it was the Holy Spirit who sent them off. And quite often, guys, the Holy Spirit will put things on our heart as you know, as, as people, as, 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 as husbands, as, as, as wives, as parents, you know, and he'll be, you know, kind of convicting us or inspiring us to do something, you know. And ultimately, if we do that, it's him that did it through us. You guys understand what I'm saying? We can absolutely deny the Holy Spirit. Paul says it like this, that we can grieve and or quench the Holy Spirit. But the, the practice of the church, the church of Christ, is to be led by the Holy Spirit. So, so again, I don't want you to kind of misunderstand this. The Holy Spirit is the one who sent them out. The church just obeyed. That's what happened here. And so I love this so much because we don't have to worry about what are we going to do here at Temple Land? What, you know, what are we going to do here? The Holy Spirit we, is here. 
And, and he absolutely will lead us and show us what he wants us to do. All we have to do is trust and obey him. And that's exactly what we see going on here. Now, this, uh, this verse at the end of our uh, verse four, where it says they went down to Seleucia. I kind of want you to see this. Remember, Antioch, Syria was about, you know, 15, 16 miles off the coast, uh, you know, right there in Syria. But to um, the west, right on the coast, was this, this uh, town called Seleucia. And this is actually the port of Antioch. Um, and they went there simply to get on a ship and go to Cyprus, which we see, it says right there, from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, Cyprus itself, guys, was actually the homeland of Barnabas. Remember, it's Barnabas and it's Saul that had been sent out. So, uh, kind of cool that the Holy Spirit would lead them to go there first. And I think it's the right thing, right? Because Barnabas, being a native from that land, would have known people. You know, he, he, he would have had relationships that he built up which is a very good example for all of us guys. Like, you know, we can absolutely go out and try to cold call people and, you know, on the street and try to bring the gospel to them, right? But you're going to be very effective in the relationships that you build. You understand what I'm saying? And so the Holy Spirit indeed sent Barnabas, you know, and Saul first to Cyprus. What's cool is, is after they leave Cyprus, they're going to go north uh, just right next to, to, to where Saul is from. You know, Saul is from uh, Tarsus, right? Cilicia. They're actually going to go there in uh, the next set of verses that we that we go over next week. But anyway, from there, from Seleucia, right, the port, the seaport of Antioch, it says that they sail right to Cyprus to a place called Salamis. Now, if I can give you a picture here, Cyprus is like if you saw it on a map, it's like this big. Okay, on a map, it's not as big or whatever, but it's about 148 miles across. Okay. And on the east side of Cyprus, right, is where Salamis is. And then you have some, you know, the Mediterranean here. And then this is where uh, Syria is. And Seleucia would have been there. So they sailed to Cyprus on the east side. And it says this, that they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now, as we go through Acts, you will see this is the common practice of, of Saul, also known as Paul, right? This is his common practice to first bring the gospel of Christ, right? The word of God that points to Messiah Christ, right? Um, to the Jews, right? It says, in the word it says, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. This was his normal practice, uh, you know, but I, I, have to, I have to say that based on the fact that Luke doesn't write much about what happened regarding him going to these synagogues, I don't think he really had a whole lot of success in the synagogues which we also will see as we go through the book of Acts, by and large, the Jewish people didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. They didn't want him when he came as a man, and they certainly didn't want to hear about him after uh, he had ascended to heaven, guys. So I, I don't think that they had much success bringing uh, the gospel to the synagogues. Um, and then we'll continue there. It says, they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Now, really quickly, John is the same guy we talked about from last chapter, John Mark. Uh, his mother was Mary. Remember, Mary's house is where all the disciples were praying for Peter when he was in prison and he was about to be executed. Remember, James was executed. His, he was beheaded by, by Herod. Remember that? And uh, the church was there at Mary's house praying for Peter be, to be delivered, and indeed he was delivered. But uh, John Mark... That was his mom. And again, as I told you last week, this is the same John Mark, right, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, as we know, in the New Testament. He's also Barnabas' nephew, and he was a very close friend to Peter, which a lot of theologians believe is where he got most of his information about the Gospel that he wrote, which some even believe that it should be called the Gospel of Mark, it should be called the Gospel of Peter, but whatever. Um, but again, uh, you know, this is that same John Mark. Uh, also in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 14, verses 51 through 52, this is a lot believed to be the same guy who actually was wearing like a, like a robe or some type of a, of, a, of a body covering. And when Jesus was arrested in the garden, the guards tried to get him and they actually got him by his clothes and he ran away naked out of the garden. This is the same guy. And we're going to see next week this same guy as it happened to running away 
uh, in Acts 13, 13, that's where that is, but we'll talk about that next week. But anyway, this is that guy, Mark, and I only tell you guys this because I want to make connections with you guys so that you guys can see and, and, and kind of see all how everything connects together. Let's continue there, verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. So, uh, again, they went through the whole island, guys, and we still aren't hearing Luke writing anything about what's going on or what had been going on. There are a lot of places, a lot of towns, if you will, on Cyprus, right? And so literally, uh, Salamis is on the eastmost side of Cyprus. Well, guess where Paphos is? It's on the westmost side of Cyprus. And so at this point, I don't think they were having a whole lot of luck. You guys have been fishing, right? And, and you're just, you've been there for hours trying to catch it. You haven't even had a bite. You know, I know that you, that you, uh, you brought Moral Brothers can relate to that, right? You just haven't had a bite. Well, I think that's what was going on here. But then all of a sudden they come to Paphos and it says that they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Now, really quickly, guys, uh, that word magician is the word magi. And uh, it is the name given by Babylonians, uh, uh, you know, by by Asians, uh, you know, uh, all of the all of the Gentile non-Jewish nations. It's the name that they gave them for guys that were like wise men or teachers or priests or astrologers, right? Uh, guys that were supposed to be leading people, right, in the spirituality of the nation, right? But the truth is, is that God didn't call them any of those things. No, God called them false prophets and sorcerers. That's what they were. And that's what this guy Bar Jesus was, because he was a, a straight up sorcerer, guys. He was a, 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 pra a practitioner of the dark arts, if you will. Now, um, it says here in verse 7 that he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Now, Sergius Paulus uh, was the governor of, of, uh, of, of the province, right? And he would have been a Roman uh, Senate appointed governor, right? And he absolutely wanted to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear the gospel. And I love this because what that means is, is that the word of Jesus, the word about Jesus was getting out. And I, I, I bring this up quite often, guys, because back then they didn't have the internet. They didn't have phones, right, to, to snap somebody something, right, or send an Instagram or, you know, for you, for us older folks, you know, do a Facebook post or something, right? Uh, they didn't have any of that, right? And yet Jesus' name is being heard of you know, throughout the land, you know, and even on the island of Cyprus. And so this guy wanted to hear the gospel. As a matter of fact, he says that he was a very intelligent man, and he summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Verse 8, but Elimus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So bar Jesus, guys... This guy was wrong. I mean, Luke labeled him from the beginning a false prophet. And literally, guys, uh, you know, a false prophet, they had false prophets in the Old Testament times. They had false prophets, which are also called false teachers, in the New Testament times, guys. And, you know, we are warned throughout the scriptures, and specifically, uh, uh, you know, to the church in the New Testament about false teachers, right? False prophets, you know. And that's exactly who Bar Jesus is. And I'll tell you guys, the reason why Bar Jesus wanted to prevent the proconsul from, you know, hearing the word of God, from hearing the truth, is because I believe with all my heart that this guy had a really good thing going with Sergius Paulus. As a matter of fact, it says in the word here, very kind of like uh, nonchalantly, that he was with, Bar Jesus was, was with the proconsul. But... The, the reality is, is he actually was the spiritual advisor to the proconsul, which again is the governor. Think about that. It'd be like somebody, you know, being the spiritual advisor to our governor, which is a scary thought. Um, but it'd be as if, you know, it was somebody that was a spiritual advisor to her. And, and even in the White House, guys, uh, you know, you guys know Billy Graham, I'm sure. Billy Graham was a spiritual advisor to every president from Harry S. Truman, our 33rd president, all the way through Obama. You know, so this uh, this kind of practice of having spiritual advisors was something that goes way back even to the first century, and we see that very very much here. But nonetheless, this guy was not really about spiritually advising as much as he was about gaining. You know what I'm saying? 
And he obviously was good at his trade, right, being a false prophet, because he was good enough that, that he could get a job as, again, that advisor, spiritual advisor to the governor guys. And again, this guy was trying to prevent the truth from being brought to the proconsul. And even today, guys, we see this, right? We see a lot of folks using God or Jesus' name for their gain, right? They want to gain the people's trust. They want to gain the people's admiration so that they can gain, right? They talk about God. They talk a good game, right? And they, and they sound real intelligent. And then they, they say all these things that kind of make people, like, believe in what they're saying or something, right? But really, what their motive is is to gain something. And really, there's two different types, if you will. They're either trying to get personal gain, like, you know, the normal things, money, power, you know, fame or glory, right? Or they're trying to push their worldview or their lies on people, right? And the reason why people do that is because they don't want to be held accountable for their sin. They don't want to come, you know, to the only living God, the one true living God, you know, and, and admit that they're wrong. You know, and so we see a lot of that going on today. We see a lot of that going on in the progressive church today, um, you know, kind of twisting the scriptures, you know. Um, but again, these guys, although some think of them as prophets or great teachers, God calls them false prophets. God calls them sorcerers, you know. Um, and so we just, you know, we want to be careful of these types of folks, guys, because again, as we see here, his aim is to gain. But in order to keep his personal gain all about the self, he's going to prevent Sergius Paulus from receiving the one and true only thing that can, that can save him and make him right with God. And he doesn't care at all. And that's 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 the normal practice in the heart of folks that try to bring you into, into their lives. You know? And it's sad, guys. I mean, you know, Jesus, you know, he said, you know, that it'd be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck if you cause even one of these to trip up. You know? And so I don't understand why folks, I mean, I get it, right? If you don't want to come to God, if you don't want to believe in Jesus Christ, that's your business, you know? And, and you will be responsible for that, personally responsible to God for that. That's between you and God. But to try to lead others away from God. I mean, you know, I hear atheists, they're so bent on not letting people come to the Lord, right? Why is it? What does it hurt, right? If that person goes, you, you know, like, Mr. Atheist, if you're right, how has that person somehow, you know, been, been hurt? Or how is he or she less, less off? She, they're not. They're better for it, you know? They're, the society is better for it. <clears throat> Yet you have these people that try to push their lies and their, you know, and their worldview, you know, to try to prevent people from coming to the true living God and receive salvation through Jesus Christ. It's, it's really sad, guys. They, they use this false prophecy, this false teaching, you know, for their for their gain. But that, that's what was going on here with Bar Jesus, guys. And he was so good, like I said, he was able to get this job as spiritual advisor. Um, you know, um, we just want to make sure that we're being careful about that. And I, I'll tell you something, guys. You know, uh, you, you hear a lot about people talking about, uh, these days, and specifically Christians, talking about um, how, you know, um, we need to be humble, we need to be loving, you know. And so... If somebody is teaching false things or if someone's a false prophet, you know, call it out, but don't name names, you know. Be humble, be loving, you know. You know, guys, that's not the practice of, of Saul that, we're, that, that we have here. As a matter of fact, in 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20, he not only called them out and said that their faith was shipwrecked, he named them, you know. He called them out. He says, Hymenaeus and Alexander, that, that their faith is shipwrecked, guys. And so... My point is, guys, is that we need to expose this stuff. You know, we don't just take a, you know, like a blind eye of this stuff and nonchalantly just, you know, pass it off as nothing. It's a big deal. You know, we fight for the souls of the world because we are Christians, right? And we know what happens to souls that don't turn to Christ. And so we want to make sure that we're constantly proclaiming the truth, obviously with our words, but also with our deeds. And sometimes, guys, that means we've got we to gotta be tough. You know, sometimes we gotta just call it out and don't don't be ashamed. Don't feel like you're somehow un being unloving. And no, on the contrary, you are very much being loving when you tell somebody the truth. You know, very very much being loving. Let's continue there, verse nine. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him that is Bar Jesus. 
and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all, uh, of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. So guys, you have Bar Jesus, you know, who was trying to prevent the work of God, right? That was that was really actually going very well, right? You had a guy that actually wanted to hear it. Okay, Bar Jesus didn't so much want to hear it, but Sergius Paulus wanted to. He's trying to prevent this, right? And the enemy was absolutely using him to prevent this. But now you have the Holy Spirit using Paul to respond to Bar Jesus's efforts. And again, remember, guys, Bar Jesus is a magician, and I, I have to, you know, just really quickly on a sidebar, I have to say this: there are some who believe that magic and miracles are the same thing, and I want you guys to know they are not the same thing. And and, and, and basically, the the main reason why they're not the same thing because they have two entirely different sources. Okay, magic is of the enemy. Magic is of the devil. Miracles are of God. It's specifically from the power of God, guys. And so, you know, please don't kind of conflate those two things because they are not the same thing. And so many people today very, you know, very wrongly, uh, you know, kind of connect these things together uh, because, you know, obviously they are, you know, spiritual power, you know. But again, magic comes from the dark side. Miracles come from the light side, God's side, guys. So make sure that you're differentiating between the two. Um, but anyway, uh, Bar Jesus trying to use his, you know, his, his, you know, his influence, right, uh, his quote unquote abilities uh, to prevent Sergius Paulus from receiving the gospel. The Holy Spirit absolutely responds here to uh, what the enemy was trying to do through Bar Jesus. <clears throat> Again, it says that Saul, that is Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to say this real quickly. He's been called Saul all the way up to this point. And remember, guys, Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul is his Greek or Roman name. From now on, you will not hear him be called Saul anymore. He is called Paul from this moment on for the remainder of the book of Acts and in any of his epistles where he is named. He is called Paul. And again, the reason why is because Paul was specifically called by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles, right? And that's the name that would have, uh, you know, resonated with them, right? Is the name Paul, a Greek name, guys. But nonetheless, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and I want you guys to see this. That filling there does not mean that he was already filled with the Holy Spirit. It means that in that moment, he became filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, it, it, remember, guys, I've taught you this before. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is an empowering to do something. And most of the time it has to do with exercising your spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you, right? Um, and that's exactly what we see going on here. Again, the tense here is the, is the aorist tense uh, in the Greek. Again, that means that in that moment it happened. And what happens here is the Holy Spirit actually causes Paul to exercise his spiritual gift, which is the gift of faith here, guys. Okay? I love this. It says that he looked intently at him. And I want you to see this because what is a, what's about to happen here is a miracle. Okay? It's a miracle because it's coming from the power of God. All right? And I'm not running around just like saying, you're going to be blind, you're going to be blind. Like, it's literally the power of God that's doing this, which means it is a miracle. And, and it's important that we see that it says that he looked intently at it. Because, guys, if you went to Acts chapter 3, you would see that this is exactly what Peter did to the lame beggar at the gate called Beautiful. It says that he looked intently at him. And then he, and then he was healed. So literally what happened was, is when Peter had ex exercised that spiritual gift of healing, right, which was, a, which was a miracle from God, the Holy Spirit did that through Peter. And we see the very same thing going on here. Now, you're probably thinking, well, hold on, Dave. A miracle? He just made this guy blind. Guys, what makes a miracle a miracle is that it comes from the power of God. We need to understand that first. It's not always going to be a positive thing for the receiver of the miracle. In this case, obviously, it isn't, right? But the purpose of the miracle, right, in all miracles, as Jesus says, he calls them miraculous works, right? The purpose of them, guys, is simply this. 
to make the person that's exercising the miracle and speaking the truth of God, to make them to be approved, to be known that they're approved by God. In other words, the people that see this miracle say, wow, this person must really be from God because they just did this miracle. So whatever they're saying, I don't know, like, Jesus is the Christ, repent your sin for the kingdom is, is at hand, stuff like this, right? Whatever they're saying can be trusted because God just proved that he is with that person and what they're teaching because he just did a miracle through them. And so literally, that's what the purpose of miracles is. Let me... Uh, let me read to you uh, John 10, 37 and 38, because Jesus actually spoke to this. Jesus says this, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. And that word works there is literally miraculous works, miracles, the works of my Father. Then do not believe me, verse 38. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Look at John 5, 36. Uh, Jesus says this, But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, that is John the Baptist. He says, For the works, again, that's the miraculous works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And so guys, the purpose of miracles is not to woo people. It's not to do a magic show and then you know, take a collection and a hat. It's to, it's to let people know that the words you are saying are real, that they're true. And that's exactly what we see going on here. Paul, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit through Paul, you know, executes this miracle by making Bar-Jesus blind. And let me tell you something, guys. Again, just as I said a second ago, Paul had a practice of calling out the darkness, exposing the darkness. Ephesians 5.11, Paul wrote this, Take no part in the unfruitful works of of darkness, okay? That's magic. That's what he's talking about here, okay? He says, but instead, expose them. Okay, so listen here, guys. There's an implication in that verse, Ephesians 5.11, okay? He says, take no part in dark arts, in magic, right? He says, but instead, expose them. Literally, the implication is this. You can't be neutral on it. If you see this going on, guys, as Christians... You have a responsibility to call it out, guys, because there's a danger. And you know you would do this, guys, right? If, if, if say, for instance, that you were like, you know, you were you were walking like on a path, and, and as you were coming along, all of a sudden, part of the path broke away, and down, you know, 200 feet is like, you know, it's just a cliff, a straight drop to jagged rocks. And as you, as you passed that area, you were walking, and someone was coming in the opposite direction, right? You know you would warn them, right? You told me, well, tell me, hey, be careful, man. There's like a, a, a broken apart over there. You know, you can fall to your death. And in the same sense, guys, we need to have that same kind of heart and attitude and diligence when it comes to the things um, that are lies. And specifically things where people say, this is of God. God thus saith the Lord, you know. People use these kinds of like fancy, fancy statements to try to get people to believe what they're saying. But it brings no glory to God at all, guys. It, and again, that's how you can tell even what is coming from the dark side and what's coming from God. Is if it doesn't glorify God, then you know it isn't coming from God. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes you can't even tell, right? Sometimes something cool really happened, right? A miracle happened, you know, and you're like, wow, that's really cool. You know, God must really be in this. And then someone tells you, yeah, Jesus isn't the only way. You know what I'm saying? You can know for sure, right? when it does not glorify God, and more specifically, doesn't glorify Jesus. But I love this, because Paul calls it out, man. He, he, he literally doesn't pull any punches. He's, he's talking trash here. He says, you son of the devil, you know? <clears throat> you worker of villainy. You enemy of righteousness. Like, he's calling it out. And listen, guys, it's not like he took the Bible and said, hey, I want to talk to you for a second, Bart. Come over here, Bart, Jesus. I want to talk to you. Like, he shouted it out in the presence of everybody. You know, called him out. You know, called him to the mat, even. You know, and all of a sudden from there, he says that the hand of the Lord is upon you, right? And you will be blind for a season, guys. Okay, so what we need to see here is, look, I say this all the time. I know how cool we think we are. I know how great we think we are, right? But it is the hand of God that is the power, not us. You know, greater is the one who is in me than the one who is in the world. 
It doesn't say greater am I. It says greater the one who is in me. And that is the Holy Spirit, guys. And it is indeed by his hand that this miracle was exercised and executed. Even Paul doing it. It's not like Paul said, okay, you know, Holy Spirit, let's get this guy. Holy Spirit told Paul, let's get this guy. You know what I mean? Holy Spirit was leading Paul into this, guys. Even the equipping, right? I mean, we're taught this in 1 Corinthians 12. That even the execution of the gifts, the, the timing of it and everything has been determined by the Holy Spirit. And, and he's the one who leads us. That's exactly what we see going on here. And again, this blinding of our Jesus is absolutely a miracle of God because it's by the power of God, the Holy Spirit dies, okay? Now, I love this again because, like I said, the purpose for miracles is what? It's to get people to believe in the words that you are speaking. I can sit here all day long and say I have a billion dollars in the bank, but until you see my bank, my, you know, my bank book, you're going to say, okay, whatever, Dave. You know, even, I can say whatever I want to, right? But the proof is in the pudding. And guys, that's exactly what we see happening here. Because look what happens, right? It says, then, verse 12, then the proconsul believed, okay? He believed when he saw what had occurred. See this? The proconsul saw the miracle, right? He had heard the teaching. He had heard about Jesus already, but he had heard the teaching of Barnabas and Paul. Sees the miracle, and now it says that he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord, and he believed it. He believed it, guys. So please know, guys, that look, all the things that we do, whatever they are, they can be really small to us or really big to us. You know what makes them big is two things. When God is glorified and a soul is saved, that's what makes them big. And this is a big deal, right? I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit just blinded somebody, guys. But you could do something very little. And the Holy Spirit used that as, as power to draw a soul to himself. And guys, that makes it a really big thing, guys. A really, really big thing. And I love this guy so much because Bar Jesus went from trying to prevent Sergius Paulus to res you know, from receiving the gospel, right? He was fighting back. He was pushing back. He was this big guy, if you will, to Sergius Paulus, right? The spiritual advisor to Sergius Paulus. He went from that big guy to all of a sudden this little guy now looking for someone to help him, to lead him. Let me read that to you again uh, at the end of verse um, 11 or just verse 11. It says, uh, immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. He went from being this great, big, strong guy to being not so much, to being humbled by the Lord, guys. And I and honestly, guys, I, you know, I, I, I feel like this was quite merciful of God, right? Not to do more than what he did. Because remember, just in the last chapter, what happened to Herod? Like, Holy Spirit dropped that dude dead. Remember what happened with Ananias and Sapphira when they were trying to steal glory from God? They were killed, you know? So I find this to be particularly very uh, merciful by God not to take this guy down, but actually kind of give him a reprieve, you know? And, and, and even the fact that not only is he not going to be blinded for life, but he's, it's only for a season, as Paul says here. Almost as if God has hope still in this guy. And I love that about God. Man, God is a God of chances, man. Awesome, awesome to see that, guys. That God would be so loving in that way. But, but again, nonetheless, guys, you know, this is very, uh, like, characteristic of God, right? Bar Jesus tries to do some things, right, to prevent the work of God. And God takes the very thing that Bar Jesus was trying to do and makes, turns it on, right? So, you say, what are you saying, Dave? Well, Bar Jesus was trying to blind Sergius Paulus from seeing the truth. <laughs> you see it? And God turned it around on him and made him blind. And remember the book of Esther? Remember Haman, what he was trying to do there and genocide the Jews? And he had this big old 75 foot tall gallows set up to kill all the Jews. And when the king got wind of that, remember that? <laughs> All of a sudden, Haman was the one that was hung up on them gallows. I mean, God has a tendency of doing this. Even uh, Satan's plan to try to foil the Messiah's, you know, plan to save the souls of the world. What did Satan try to do? He tried to kill Jesus, right, so that Jesus couldn't save the world. Well, in killing Jesus, <laughs> he saved the world. He conquered death. And this is the way of God, guys. You know, we can sit here all day long and try to fight God, try to go against God, and we have all make these plans and, and, and grab all these worldly resources to fight against God. But God's 
plan will be seen through, guys. God's power is the ultimate power, guys. And you know, sadly, Bar Jesus was where he was because he was trying to do things on his own power, guys. He was trying to do these things on his own power, guys. But I love this because despite the efforts of Bar Jesus with his power, God's power alone stopped the enemy and saved the soul. And you guys see this story? This is, this is your story. You guys see this? Like, like you are, if you're a Christian today, you're a Christian today because God, by his power, stopped the enemy to save you. Because, listen, guys, the reality is, is that we're taught in Romans 1, 16, that the power of God, is, you know, is the gospel, right, unto salvation, right? And God's power is what saved you from the course you were on. It doesn't, I don't care if you say, well, I was raised in a Christian home. I was already, no, you weren't saved until the day you raised your hand and said, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I need you. I need a Savior. Please save me from me. And when you did that, it was the power of God, right, that did that. It was his gospel. It was the power from the convicting work of the Holy Spirit on your heart. But nonetheless, it was God's power alone that stopped the enemy and saved your soul. So I say this, guys. Because your reliance on the power of God has not changed. And yet I, I feel like a lot of us, we rely on God for some things, but we don't rely on God for all things. And I feel like if you're anything like me, what happens is, is that God will give us a little, a little cookie, right? And, you know, give us a little leeway here, right? And we'll go kind of go run with that. And then all of a sudden we'll think, well, I don't really need to go to God anymore. I'm good. You know, like, I'll go to God when I need him, but I'm good. I got this, God. I got this, you know. And I feel like that happens quite often with a lot of us, guys. And what happens is, is we're literally relying on our own power in those times. Just like we see Bar Jesus doing here. Now, our own power, relying on our own power all the time, in every situation, guys, it doesn't matter. It has to do with us wanting to be for self. You guys understand what I'm saying? And so we got to make sure, guys, that we are relying on the power of God and specifically the power of the Holy Spirit in us and upon us, guys. And listen, that's the representation of God on the planet today is the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus came and he ascended. He sits at the right hand of the Father today, making intercession for us all day long. But the Holy Spirit is still here and he is here in the hearts of all the believers. And listen, it's not like God the Father and God the Son are like in heaven and we're like kind of disconnected from them. Do you understand that if you have the Holy Spirit in your heart today, and you do if you're a Christian, that you are connected to God that way. Literally, you're connected to the Trinity because you have the Holy Spirit, because you are part of the body of Christ, guys. And so we have to make sure, guys, that we are relying on the power of God the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives. Okay? Jesus, the man, right, he was fully God and fully man, also depended solely on the power of God, the Holy Spirit, when he was here on the planet. Let me read to you Acts 10, 37 through 38. It says this, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who oppressed all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And guys, this is exactly what Jesus told us we would need, that he would give us before he ascended to heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he said, You will receive power, and you will be my witnesses, right? By the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He said this, guys. And yet I feel like we forget that. I feel like we want to kind of take things on ourselves by our own power. You know, again, you know, God gives us a little bit of success here, and it's always by his power, right? I mean, we see the success here with Paul and Barnabas. They just saved the soul, right? But it was only because of God's power, right? But we do that, and then we just kind of go off on our own. You know, guys, and, and I, I, I'm telling you guys, that there's a terrible danger there. Uh, let, let me just tell you, the early church, they stayed with the Holy Spirit. 
They stayed dependent on the Holy Spirit. They stayed reliant on the power of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit counseled and instructed them. The Holy Spirit affirmed them. The Holy Spirit sent them. He equipped them. He directed them. He even directed them in their equipping, as we saw here right now with Paul exercising the gift of faith, right? The Holy Spirit, his hand was in all of it, guys. And we have to understand that, listen, if we're not relying on the power of God by the Holy Spirit, then we're relying on our own power, guys. In Jeremiah 17, uh, verses 5 through 6, that was our reading today. It tells us what happens to a person who relies on their own power. Let me read that to you again. It says this, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness and in an inhabited salt land. So guys, if you are relying on your own power today, you are literally cursed, guys. And listen, if you want to know if you're relying on your own power, it actually, in that text, tells us how you can tell if you're relying on your own power. There are symptoms that you can see in your life. First of all, it says there that his heart turns away from the Lord. They're unfaithful. They have no faith, guys. Do you find at times when things get hard that all of a sudden your faith just kind of falls out the window? You know, that's probably because in that moment or in that time, in that season, you're relying on your own power. Then the next verse there in verse 6, he says, he is like a shrub in the desert. He literally means that you're not growing. Do you find, can you find yourself kind of like in a spot where you're just not growing in the Lord? Anybody ever go to the gym for a time and in the beginning you're like, you're like wow, man, my boss is just sitting all in. You do lift him for a while, you think that, you know, you're getting big and everything. And then all of a sudden you hit this kind of wall, right? And you're like, what is going on? I'm doing the same things that I'm doing, but I just, I'm not getting any growth, you know? Then all of a sudden some other bigger guy comes in and he says, yeah, you've got to take supplements, you know, or, or whatever it is, right? Well, those supplements, guys, we can liken them to the power of God. You guys know what I'm saying? Relying on the power of God. And when you rely on yourself, we see it here, you're like a desert shrub. There is no growth. Then he says, and he shall not see any good come. Literally, guys, even when good comes at you, you don't see it. Why? Because you don't believe. You literally, your belief has gone out the window. These are all symptoms, guys, of somebody who is relying, again, on their own power and not on the power of God. Then it says, he shall dwell in parched places of the wilderness. Literally, guys, that means they're uninspired. You, you know, anybody, anybody, anybody here today uninspired about your walk with Christ? We should be excited about our walk with Christ. We should be excited about what God is doing. You feel a little uninspired today? Maybe you've been putting, you know, yourself in a spot where you're just relying on your own power. And then the final thing it says here, they are in an inhabited salt land, guys. And literally, it means to be all alone. They're, de they're detached, right? They're detached from the church. You know what I mean? Sure, they, maybe you come to church, but even when you're there, you don't really feel connected. You don't really feel plugged in. Guys, if any of these things is true of you today, and look, I am not throwing stones at you. I'm loving on you. If any of these things are true of your walk today, check whose power you're relying on. You know what I'm saying? Self-reliance, guys, also, it just doesn't work. I won't read the verses for the sake of time, but I will say this, that in Ecclesiastes chapters, uh, or verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, literally, guys, all the things that we do are meaningless, right? In Ecclesiastes, it's called toil, right, or folly. All the things that we do are meaningless, right? In verses 16 through 17, that same chapter, Ecclesiastes, um, you know, if we, if we seek after personal wisdom, if we go after self-personal wisdom, like building that up, it's an endless chase. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 through 3, if we try to find self-satisfaction in this life and not in the life of Christ, it leads only to emptiness. Chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, if we're going after trying to, you know, accomplish, you know, be ambitious in the world, 
build up our wealth, that leaves us unsatisfied. And then the final thing in Ecclesiastes, um, if we're, you know, if we're going after like working hard, you know, being prideful in our work, having a good ethic in work, it only leads to frustration. The point is, guys, is that when you rely on yourself, it's meaningless. It's purposeless. When you rely on God, then there's meaning in your life. And if you guys are anything like me, I didn't even become a Christian until I became, until I was 27, guys. If you're anything like me, living in the world as long as I did, you know what I'm talking about. Things were so, I remember I was 23 years old and I, and I thought to myself, is this all life is? Working a nine to five? You know, having the house and the 2.3 kids and the dog and the two cars in the garage? Is that what this, this life's about and then we die and it's over? I, I, mean, I was only 23, right? I was just a kid and I'm thinking, how meaningless is this life? Not too much longer after that, guys. I mean, I, my, my life kind of crumbled and God, you know, tore me down and built me back up, you know. But the point is, guys, is that even as a young kid, I could see the meaningless of this kind of pursuit, of a self kind of pursuit, guys. It's meaningless. But when your reliance is on God, literally your trust is on God, right? It's not just this confident feeling that you have. It's literally a way of life, guys, internally that manifests itself out externally. Let's, can, let's finish up here so we can finish up our message and get done. Okay? Um, you know, we need to make sure that we're relying on God. And we see what happens there in Jeremiah from our reading again today, chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. It says... Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, and he does not fear when he comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So do you want to know if you can know if you're relying on the power of God and not on your own power? Well, that verse tells us there. First of all, it tells us that our confidence will be in God. It says that it sends out its roots. Literally, its roots reach out, right? Your confidence is in God. Then it says that they do not fear and they are not anxious. They are literally courageous. Then it says that they do not cease to bear fruit. In other words, they are fruitful guys. So, here's my question and then a couple more comments and we'll close, guys. How, Christian, do you put your reliance on God and His power? How do you do that? Anybody know? Because I don't know. I'm just kidding. Right. You do it, guys, by focusing on Jesus Christ. I mean, really, guys, we, we, had this, we had this teaching a few months ago about focusing on Jesus Christ. Guys, whenever you start relying on your own power, it's because you're not focusing on Jesus. You're focusing on on you. You're focusing on your circumstance. You're focusing on your problems. Do you understand? We need to make sure that we're focusing on Christ in all things. And when we do that, guys, we will be reliant not on self, but on God, guys. So listen, I just want to exhort all of you to please apply this to your life, guys. Because if you do this, not only will you have meaning in your life, but you will be the thing that God wants you to be and do the things that God wants you to do in his ministry. You may not be a pastor, you may not be a worship leader or whatever, but you will be light where you are, guys. And again, God will be glorified by your life and souls will be saved, guys, okay? So please, guys, make sure that you're living it out like Paul and Barnabas here, who completely, and in the early church, who completely you know, rely on the power of God and not on your own power, guys. And if you do that, guys, again, you will be blessed for it. Also, I want to say finally, uh, the final thing is to anybody who heard this message that doesn't know Jesus Christ, I pray you repent of your sin and that you place your faith in Jesus. Again, He is our only hope. I'm not going to sit here and tell you anything else. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or talk bad about other religions. But again, Jesus is the only way. The Bible is plain, guys. So please, uh, again, repent your sin and place your faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you, God, that we don't have to rely on our own power, our own resources, that we have your Holy Spirit, God, to help us uh, in, in, our, in our smallest need to our greatest need, God, in all things you are there. 
uh, you want to, to, to lead us and guide us, God, and cover us in all things, God. And I just pray, Father, that if anybody here or anybody who heard this message, God, has been more self-reliant than reliant on you, I pray, God, they would repent that now. And I pray, God, that they would surrender everything that they have not been given to you, that they would surrender to you now, God, and they would indeed... Uh, just rely on you and rest in your power, God. Father, we love you so much. We thank you, God, uh, for that, for the dunamis, for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, God. Again, let us live that out for your glory alone, God. And also, we just want to pray for all the souls that heard the message today, that maybe they were touched by it, God, that indeed they would repent their sin and place their faith and their trust in you. God, we thank you again for your Son and our Savior, Jesus, and for your Holy Spirit, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.